Hello, my name is Leonard Kleinrock. I'm chairman of the Computer Science Department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes to that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you've chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture's about to begin. All right, welcome. Welcome to the last in our distinguished series lectures. Today we're privileged to have Ken Kennedy, otherwise known as Mr. Compiler, the world's most famous researcher and developer in compiler technologies, you'll see. And of course, I'm going to give you some of the background which brought him to where he is today. So let's go to the background. Uh, Ken actually comes from a very interesting family. His uncle was one of four chemists who developed a procedure to isolate plutonium in Los Alamos during the war. Now, when I say the war, I hope you know which the war I mean. <laughs> his father's background was as a civil engineer in construction. And after graduating first in his class at West Point, became a brigadier general in the US Army Corps of Engineers. And among the things that he did was to, in, in, in the military assistance command in Vietnam, continue to build air bases there. It's probably the largest investment and expenditure during wartime that the government undertook. It's $500 million in one year in Vietnam. In addition, uh, his father managed after the war to save Athens' water system. He managed to create a system where he could pump water over the mountain into Athens at a time when their own supply was inadequate. In fact, they offered him a position there to run, the, uh, to run as a state engineer upon retirement. In addition, his mother's side consisted of attorneys and lawyers. And his mother's father was a justice on the Texas Supreme Court. So Ken comes from a, a notable family. This is not a case where his father was a grocer and his mother was a, a housewife. Okay, there, there's a background here. So you begin to see the development. But because his father was in the army, he hardly spent a lot of time in any one place. In fact, he made 16 shifts in 16 years, one a year from school to school. And as you see, he spent at most two years in one place in Jacksonville. But as a young man, he did the things that a lot of us young men did. We played around with science things. Electric kits, chemistry kits, erector sets. Always liked to build things. He had this electrical set. and With that, he managed to build a radio transmitter, crystal-based, low-power radio transmitter, and proceeded to transmit in the AM band, totally violating FCC rules. Hopefully, the statute of limitations is gone by now. Playing 45, um, and here's the evidence. It's not tape. <laughs> But he doesn't admit. Uh, playing music, having the 45 RPM record, sending sound into the air, picking up a microphone, and putting it to a transmitter. So the neighbors just loved this. Um, he read popular electronics, popular mechanics. He built heat kits. He has continued to build heat kits all the way through the middle of his, his professorial career. And as he says, he built two of the top line stereo receivers. He always wanted to be a physics major because in high school, the physics books were really engineering books, but he didn't know it. He wasn't quite sure what the physicist was, but the material interested him. He spent his longest time in one junior high school in Jacksonville, um, two years there. He went to fine schools throughout the Army career. And on the way, his father, as a good mathematician, taught Ken to do mathematics. He was very strict. And the difference between Ken's generation and his father's generation is that his father knows how to take square roots by hand. 
<laughs> Ken and I agreed neither one of us could do it right now. I'd be interested to see how many of you can do it by hand. <laughs> one guy I know knows how to do it. But, not to be undone, he spent two years in Japan in this tour of the army as a young man. And he learned to use the abacus. He's a wizard abacus user. He'll challenge anybody in the room here. I didn't speed say abacus. <laughs> he didn't say it. I did. I challenged him for it. Okay. He went to Rice, wanted to do physics, as you might expect. And he continued to do it through his junior year at Rice. But he was a lousy physics lab student. And the only thing that saved him in the physics labs is that he took the data from all the students in the laboratory, put it on a computer, and got a precise data analysis through the aggregate of the data. Okay. This impressed the physics chairman. The physics chairman called Ken in and told him, Ken, you'll never make it in physics. Okay. <laughs> but because of the work he had done in the, in, in the laboratory, in the computer side, he said, you ought to go into math. And Ken said, what? Is people can get a degree in mathematics? The answer was yes. So Ken switched to math. And he finishes a math major. And he liked some math, but he wasn't too fond of it. Because he didn't find a connection to reality. Basically, he's an engineer at heart. And needed some grounding. He was ready to go to grad school in mathematics, since that's what his bachelor's degree was in. And he chose Quran, since lots of people had gone to Quran at NYU. He went there to study under Jacob T. Schwartz, He's the co-author of Dunford and Schwartz's book on uh, linear operators. But Jerry Berkowitz, the chairman, sat him down with bad news. The bad news was that Schwartz had gone into computer science. And so don't you really want to choose someone else? And Ken said, nah, sounds interesting. Let's go get a degree in computer science. He said it made sense to follow Schwartz. Ken got one of the first computer science degrees in NYU in 1971. But most of the intellectual work and, in, in, and inspiration came from someone whom some of you may know, a fellow named John Cock. How many of you know him? This man is brilliant. He's responsible for, for risk computing, for example. The ideas originated with him. But Cock was a hard person to deal with. He got very excited about his own ideas, and occasionally the student could get a word or two in edgewise. But Cock would think a lot about the problems that the students did present to him and come back with, with suggestions. Ken remembers very clearly the day that he met John Cock. Okay, he was brought there on a Saturday, John, to meet Ken because of some work Ken had done in simulation. And they started talking. Ken looked at his, John looked at his watch and said, oops, let's go get a beer. Because there's a football game on between UCLA and some small three-letter school down the road from here. <laughs> two-letter back. <laughs> and a two-letter back, right. The letters, initials are OJ, okay? <laughs> Competing with our, our fellow, um, who was, who was it again? Gary Beaver. Barry Beaver, thank you. That famous well, I was at that game. I remember what they did to us. But there they are, watching this football game, and John suddenly goes into a deep analysis on a napkin as to what Ken should be doing regarding um, some register allocation and coloring-based algorithms for it. You got a picture of it, okay? The ball game's going on. John Gordon there with the beer. He's not watching the game. He's got Ken deeply involved in these coloring algorithms. <laughs> and in fact, some of those ideas later became the concepts for risk. It was a little too early for that to be apparent at that time. Six or seven, ladies, six or seven years later, it became a major IBM project. In fact, almost everything John did turned into a major IBM project. <laughs> so Ken did a... Uh, a thesis on register allocation from compiler-based allocation of CPU registers. It was a straight compiler thesis. He wrote all the algorithms in SETL, which he says is fast to implement, but terribly slow to run, and terribly hard to read. There he went to rise as a faculty member in 1971 in the math science department, because there was no computer science department there. There were no computer science people in the math science department. At best, he had numerical analysts. And in fact, he spent 13 years in that department until in 1984 the CS department was founded. As, and it, it, in fact, the math department was brought in to the engineering department as well, so that this math science and computer science in the same engineering school at the time. Strange combination, strange combination of strengths. 
That explains Ken's interest in numerical calculations. And he worked with world-class numerical analysts at the time. Ken was the founding member of the Rice Science and Technology Center on Parallel Computation. This is 1989. This is a significant achievement in terms of administration. It's the largest scientific and technology center that NSF has. Um, his work in interprocessor analysis and optimization and transformation of compiler systems. He deals with whole programs with automatic parallelization and semi-automatic parallelization. And that led to Fortran D and to eight high performance Fortran, which you're going to hear about today. He's a National Academy member. I asked him what inspired him along the way. And you can see some of the inspirations, his family background, John Cock. Then he came up with another name. He was a headmaster at a private school, private high school in Jacksonville. Um, a gentleman named Edwin Heinrich, a physicist. And his model, his, his morale, his, his motto to, to, to Ken was, aim high. And that basically leads to the message that Ken wants to give. It says, not only should you aim high in your goals, but don't limit your horizon to a short-term view. Don't let something like the limitation of the duration of a contract limit how far you want to foresee your research. Two years isn't long enough. Five years begins to get right, and 10 years is a horizon you should be looking at as well as you can. Ken, it's all yours. <clears throat> when Mike Gertuzos uh, did this uh, same kind of uh, thing to me uh, last year, I saved one John Cox story for myself to tell. <laughs> Those of you who know John Cox know that he was the kind of person he loved to go around Yorktown Heights uh, in the offices, and he would walk into people's offices and get them interested in a project which he said would take a graduate student for a weekend, but would turn often into that graduate student's life, life's work. And, uh, and so one has to be a little careful in dealing with John whenever he asks you a question, because that question might be loaded with uh, a responsibility. And uh, one day this happened to me. I was uh, there for the summer, and I was sitting in an office working on a project that I was assigned, and John drops in, and he asked me if I knew Lisp. And I recognized immediately this danger, danger. <laughs> So I said, uh, uh, no, John, I, I really don't know any Lisp. Uh, this was a, a lie, but, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was, uh, it was in my best interest, I recognized at that moment. I said, but why, why do you ask? He said, well, I found this Lisp program that was written in Japan by somebody who does some fancy compiler optimizations, and I'm looking for somebody to read it to me. And I said, well, gee, I'm really sorry. I wish I could help you, John, but I uh, can't do it. So I saw him about a week later. And, uh, and I ran to him, and I, I asked him whether he found anybody to read this program to him. And he said, oh yeah, I found, uh, I found John McCarthy. And I said, <laughs> I said, you know, I thought, poor John McCarthy. He couldn't deny that he <laughs> So I guess there is a... Certain that anonymity is, uh, is to be desired. Okay, so what I, I'm going to talk about today, uh, in the little time remaining, <laughs> is, uh, is some work we've been doing uh, in our center on uh, the support for architecture independent parallel programming. And I'd say it's not just work in our center, but I hope to talk about this in a way that covers really the efforts and contributions of the whole community that have been working on attempting essentially to support a particular kind of parallel programming in a fairly machine independent way. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about philosophy and about the languages and then uh, uh, discuss what might go wrong and how we might with, with, the, with this whole process and how we might, the, the dangers that lie ahead and how we might uh, get past them. Okay, so this is the, the obligatory philosophy slide in which uh, I, this is the place that I confess that uh, parallel computing, in my view, has not been a success. It's not been the success, I think, that we all thought it would be in the mid-80s when activity really began to take off. And the reason for that has been uh, really the, the, the level and quality of software support that these machines have, have gotten. Uh, the, 
the, and, and the problem has risen because the parallel machines, although widely used in research organizations like uh, universities and, uh, and industrial and government research laboratories, really haven't found employment as the mainline, uh, the mainline computing resource for many uh, parallel, by, by that I mean scalable parallel machines or massively parallel machines, have really not been adopted as the mainline computing resource. In, in, in the commer by commercial or industrial uh, concerns. And the reason for that is, is the concern over the loss or lack of protection of the programming investment. Uh, if, you're, if you're a company uh, is betting, making a, a multi-million dollar investment in programming and betting the entire computational resource for the company or the mainline computational resource on a technology that might change out from under you in terms of its underlying program a programming interface, as soon as you're done, in other words, a new machine could come out and all of that programming might have to be redone, or at least a good part of it, you're going to be very, very cautious. And the key companies that have stayed out of parallel computing are the independent software vendors, or ISVs as they're called, who make, uh, make the commercially-based software systems that lots of people use to solve real scientific and engineering programming problems. <coughs> In addition, on top of all those things, there's still questions about whether uh, one of these parallel machines can really beat a Cray on a, on a reasonably interesting collection of machines, uh, or top of the line Cray, even though the Crays use parallel computing. So uh, in order to, to, I think, to overcome, I believe that parallel computing is still going to be, is still the right technology, but to overcome the problems, we're going to have to provide some sort of architecture independent programming support. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean that we're going to make it possible to take any algorithm and, and have, have the problem solved as fast as you can with, any other, with the best possible algorithm on each target machine. What I do mean is that if you take a particular algorithm embedded, programmed, or expressed in the, in the parallel language you're using, that algorithm will be compiled to the best it can be to, to very close to whatever that means, 50%, 90%, 80% of the best performance you can get from the same algorithm using a hand coding approach in the native uh, programming interface. Now Fortran D tries to, uh, has, has a number of other goals. In addition, of course, the main, the main purpose for the research in the first place was to provide support for scalable parallel systems, uh, all the way from a few processors to large number of processors. Uh, and because we believe that if you're dealing with a large number of processors, prim the primary source for parallelism that you uh, find with that many processors would come from looking at data parallelism. Data parallelism doesn't mean SIMD. It means taking the data domain and subdividing it in a way that uh, such that each processor operates on a portion of that data domain as, at a three-dimensional or two-dimensional data domain is divided among the processors. And the parallelism is derived that way. Uh, and the reason that's so potent is, of course, for scalable systems is that, that larger problems, larger machines can be used to solve larger problems with, with hopefully uh, comparable efficiency. Uh, we also wanted to support a somewhat more abstract view of parallelism. One could argue that PVM, message passing Fortran, uh, uh, <coughs> using a, P, uh, a standardized message passing library like PBM or the emerging uh, message, uh, message passing interface standard uh, could be the machine independent programming interface. But, uh, but most people who've been exposed at the sci in the scientific world have been exposed to that programming interface find it to be, um, let's, shall I say, uncomfortable or, uh, or not the most, not the most convenient way to express programs because most pro scientific programmers would like to express their problems in some sort of shared namespace. They'd like to be able to talk about all the data elements and refer to them in the program in a, in a, in a fairly straightforward manner. Uh, and all of the work that's done to insert communications and all of the strip mining that one has to do in order to make those communications happen with the right buffer sizes, all of those things are very, very tedious programming tasks that really would hope would be automated. So one of our goals is to automate that kind of thing. And finally, we wanted to be able to support some kind of explicit and implicit parallelism. Uh, and, and as I said, architecture independence across a wide variety of machines, including 
uh, distributed memory, shared memory, and uh, synchronous array machines. But the main thing, that the main thing, the restriction that we were able to focus on early on was the data parallelism restriction, which solved, uh, which addressed a number of problems for us. As you will see. So here is the <coughs> this philosophical organization of uh, the Fortran D uh, world. I mean, one uh, essentially the idea is. That I should start by saying that the Fortran D is a set of extensions which are somewhat orthogonal to whether or not you're programming in Fortran 77 or Fortran 90. The features can be added to both and, uh, and are useful in both. Now, I will talk primarily about the Fortran 77 D uh, effort because that's the one we actually undertook in implementation at Rice, but I will also mention the, the, uh, the work on Fortran 90. But let's assume we're talking about the Fortran 77 D version of the language, then essentially what one must begin with is a program that's written in Fortran 77, and, um, but it can't just be the old dusty deck program. There's an implicit in this process is that there's a program that's been rewritten to embody some kind of parallel algorithm, and, and that uh, essentially what's missing is the specification of which of these moves really need to be run in parallel, which of the moves or which of the areas of the program need to be run in parallel. And to that, the programmer adds a set of specifications which describe how the data arrays the, uh, in the program are to be distributed across the processors of the parallel machine. So that means that it's accompanying the, the, the program are a, set, a collection of distribution specifications which say where to put pieces of the array. I'll show you how, what those look like in a moment. Now, the interesting thing about these distribution specifications is they don't change the meaning of the program. So the program means, this, this program means the same as this program. Actually, there are a few extra features, but I'll, I'll postpone the advanced features. I'll postpone them later. But the mainline features really do not change the meaning of the program. And that means that you get a free implementation on a sequential machine just by ignoring those distribution specifications. Uh, which is a very powerful feature. However, if you, uh, if you have a compiling for a machine like Intel Paragon or uh, any, just any machine which uh, memory is packaged with the processors in a distributed fashion, you can take advantage of those specifications to generate uh, optimized code for each of these kinds of machines. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, the machines in all of these classes. Okay, but I'm going to talk primarily about the compilers for the, uh, the distributed memory MIMD class of machines as represented by the <coughs> Intel Paragon, IPSC 860 Delta and Paragon. Okay, so here's the thumbnail introduction to Fortran D. Um, there are three statements. Uh, this is the, this is not really the Fortran, this is the HDF spelling. I'll talk about that HDF in a moment. But First, there is a declaration which allows you to specify how, specify a virtual processor array, which you can think of as being as fine-grained as you could possibly need on this problem. So it's the finest grained processor array that you could use on a problem, on this particular problem. In this case, it's a 256 by 256 virtual processor array, or template. Another way to think of this is an array that takes up no storage. And you align things with this template. You align actual array elements with the template using the align statement. There are Fortran 77, Fortran 90 versions of the statement. But the basic idea of the align statement is it just tells you how elements of a particular data array were, are aligned with elements of the template in what's a fairly obvious way. <clears throat> and the important thing about this, uh, this alignment it, it is that if you are, in fact, using the suggestions represented by these specifications to optimized code, you should, if two data elements are aligned with the same template element, you should uh, end up allocating those two data elements on the same process. That's, that's what alignment means. And then there's a, so these two together tell you how to distribute data on a very fine-grained collection of processors. This is a prescription that writes in a fairly machine-independent fashion a way to map that fine-grained processor array to the actual coarse-grained processor array that you might have available. And to see how that works.
That's the block comma signal. What basically that mapping said in the distribute statement that I showed you was that if you have a four by a two by two processor array and a four by four template, uh, block comma cyclic says use block distribution for rows. That means the red and blue processors get the first two rows, and the green and the gold processors get the second two. And use a cyclic distribution for columns. That means red green processors get every other column. Processors get every other column. Cyclic distributions are useful for a, a form of load balancing. You use those in, in triangular calculations to get load balancing so that you don't uh, end up with some processors getting an enormous amount more than others. Okay, back to that slide I just showed you a minute ago. I just wanted to mention that for the Intel IF, IPSC 860 or the Intel uh, cube style machines, the compiler's general responsibilities are. Uh, it, essentially four. First, it must propagate decompositions. I, should, I forgot to mention that decompositions are uh, executable statements. So <clears throat> it is possible to have, uh, for decompositions, <coughs> propagate a long control flow to two different decompositions for the same array to meet at a particular point in the program. And there, that means you have two alternate possibilities for the decomposition that a particular array might have. This is particularly problematical when you have two call chains for the same procedure. And, and in order to compile the most efficient code, you must know as much as you can about what the decomposition or decompositions of a particular array is at a particular point where you're compiling. Uh, and Fortran D allows you to specify those once in the main program and expect they'll be propagated all over the, all over the program. So because we had an interprocedural uh, propagation mechanism, built in a, a whole program analysis and, and optimization system, we could propagate those decompositions in a procedurally and discover at every point in the program what single decomposition or multiple decompositions might hold at that point. Then, once the decompositions are known, the compiler must find parallelism. And the basic mechanism by which it finds parallelism is uh, roughly called the owner computes rule, which is, is a, a way of saying that if data is, you want to compute expressions on a processor that's close to the inputs or outputs of that, uh, of that computation. Uh, in many cases, we've actually used the owner of the left-hand side because that was well-defined. But in general, what it is, if you want to minimize uh, communication, you'd like to compute close to <coughs> the place, uh, to, to the uh, home of the, of the underlying data that you're using in that computation. And that naturally gives rise to parallelism because, for example, if you have a 1,000 element array and 10 processors and the elements are, are in a linear block decomposition, then and you, you then initialize all of them to some expression which doesn't have any uh, interdependencies among the various elements of the array, then you can do 100 elements on each of the processors entirely in parallel. That's the 100 that each processor owns. So that's how parallelism is inserted implicitly. You can also, of course, in the Fortran 90D version of the language, you can also have explicit parallelism in the form of array assignments. <clears throat> then uh, the compiler must optimize communication. And, um, and uh, the optimization, essentially the optimization, uh, the main optimization of communication is, is to take it, uh, is to make fewer, longer messages. Essentially, on the Intel class machines, and a lot of such machines, all of the cost of, of sending a message, from the compiler's perspective, it's a good approximation of the truth to say all of the cost of sending a message is loaded on the cost of sending the first byte. So you want to send as few messages as possible, and what that typically means is aggregating or vectorizing messages, single message, single word messages, into much longer messages, sending whole parts of arrays, rows, or columns, and even copying two different arrays into the same message. And finally, we, we <coughs> use as our assembly language program message pa Fortran with message passing primitives, and uh, which it, in our view is the correct uh, role for Fortran with message passing the target for compiler, compiler systems. OK, now that's a little bit about uh, Fortran D. I'd like to sort of take a, a side trip now and say, what is the relationship of Fortran D to another language you may have heard of called high-performance Fortran? And uh, 
This is a little detour. We'll come back to some of these issues in a moment. High performance Fortran, let me begin by saying we wrote Fortran D in a technical report defining the language. And it was really based upon a lot of work that was done in the community, both here and in Europe. Um, uh, the idea of using data distribution as the basis for tariff extensions for a, a, a language for, for doing data parallelism was invented a lot of places independently, and a lot of people came up with the same idea about the same time. We wrote it down into this particular form in December of 1990, a tech report that we never intended to publish. It was merely a tech report for our internal use. But it, it became, uh, quickly became a cult classic because some, for some reason people thought that it captured the right kinds of, of features, things they were looking for, and there developed a whole following. And by Supercomputing 91, there were two separate industrial groups that were talking about getting together to come up with two different standards based upon these ideas for Fortran. And Jeffrey Fox and I took uh, on the role of trying to, to make one group out of this two groups. So we, we uh, agreed we would convene a working uh, uh, a group called the High Performance Fortran Forum. Uh, this, this met, this was initiated in night, Supercomputing 91. We had a meeting in January of 92. 128 people showed up, paid their way to Houston to to, uh, to find out what was going on. We paired that to 40 people who said they were willing to come to meetings every six weeks. And we met in Dallas every six weeks uh, throughout the year. And uh, we had a draft standard that we presented uh, at Supercomputing 92 and was out in the community by December of 92. And we got public comment back by March of 93. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the language on the next slide, so I'll skip that bullet and say that the product, and I'll say more about this too, but the product compilers are all coming out in 1994. So I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting, fairly compact cycle from research technical report defining <coughs> research language through prototype implementations, through uh, informal standardization to product compilers in, uh, well, and now will be uh, about four years. A little less than four years. Okay, the language itself is a little bit different from Fortran D. First, it's based exclusively on Fortran 90. It turned out that there were lots of things, lots of problems in compiling. When you define a research language, some of your goals are different from the goals you have when you design a language that people actually want to produce products for. And a lot of problems that came up in the design and the compilation of Fortran D went away restricted it to Fortran 90 because you could then depend on off dynamic storage allocation, one of the major, uh, perhaps the, the single most, in my opinion, egregious absence from Fortran 77. Uh, and you can depend on those things. So we based it on Fortran 90, but in order to encourage people not to uh, give up, not, not to wait until they had a full Fortran 90 compiler to try some of these ideas, we defined an official subset of Fortran 90 an official HPF subset, and so that is a part of Fortran 90, and the part in the official subset is the array language uh, and things like interface blocks, but uh, it avoids the full module language and, all of, and a lot of the other, uh, a lot of the uh, data structure features that are more complicated to implement. So there's an official subset and the full language. The full language includes all of Fortran 90 plus <coughs> Uh, distribution directives as were, as in Fortran D, plus extended loop, looping and aggregate assignment directives such as the for all, which was left out of the last draft of Fortran 90. It was in the earlier draft when it was called Fortran 8x. We added a block version. For all statement is just essentially a vector do loop. Uh, then there was a do independent statement, which uh, is my, my least favorite feature of the entire language. It, it, it allows you to do unsynchronized do loops. Uh, with all of the attendant problems. Uh, that's a feature that I wasn't able to keep out of the language. It was, that, it was not in Fortran D, however. Uh, and then there are pure functions which are designed so that you can, is, is a restricted set of functions that can be used in these, sing, in these block for all statements and, and single statement for all statements effectively. And finally, uh, we took essentially a lot of the experience that came out of Thinking Machines Corporation and built into an extended, we, we defined an extended standard library uh, 
These are not intrinsics. There are only three or four added intrinsics in the language. But there are, is an extended library, extensive library of things like you know, some reduction scans, uh, scans being partial prefix operations. The things that the people at Thinking Machines found to be really useful in programming a machine like uh, in CM Fortran. CM Fortran is the closest language that existed before high performance Fortran, closest to it in philosophy. And just to show you a little bit about the participation in the HPF effort as a technology transfer effort, I think it's just about the right way things be done. We ran an open process and we had all of these companies involved in attending at one time or another. Uh, these are the people who, this, I, I, I told people, and allowed, they, I allowed, asked them, this is the quote, official slide, except one company's left off, which was added this week and I didn't have time to regenerate the slide. But these are the people who, who actually have a product that's been announced, uh, I think uh, DEC announced last week. Um, the announced HPF efforts, these are people who do not have an announced product, but they have announced they're working on some product related to HPF, and, and a product announcement is likely in the near future. And these are the companies who are not willing to even say that much, but who have been attending and are willing for me to put their name as interested in the process. And Silicon Graphics is the company that's left off, and I've got their name last week. There are probably a number of others as well. I do not put anybody on the slide without asking them first. So these are the people who have said there may be others that I don't know about. OK, so for high performance Fortran. So I claim that, uh, that, uh, that this is a kind of very, very uh, tightly, tight, tightly coupled technology transfer and research operation that is the kind of thing that I think universities and industry should do a lot of. Now, that said, and all the good things about it, what can go wrong? The high performance Fortran, I, I claim, is not yet uh, a clear success. And why not? Because we don't have products. People, have, people the products have been out there only a short time. People don't know uh, whether those products are going to work well. So here are the dangers, in my view, of, of, of ways that high, high performance Fortran can fail. The first and perhaps most important way is bad compilers. Uh, Compilation for high performance Fortran is harder than vectorization. It's harder than automatic parallelization in many ways, uh, although it will uncover more parallelism. And a, a, an example of this is I'll talk about CM Fortran, which was perhaps the single example of a, of a language closely related to high performance Fortran. And I say this not to say anything negative about my my good friends at think, Thinking Machines, because I believe Thinking Machines put together one of the best, perhaps the best, small compiler development group in the world, uh, led by Guy Steele and, uh, and a number of uh, very, very talented implementers. And yet, uh, with the introduction of the CM2, and then again with the introduction of the CM5, retargeting, getting that compiler to work well and do all the optimizations needed to satisfy the users that they're doing as well as they can on the machine took a rather long time. Uh, and in fact, on the CM5, it's not even all the way there yet. <coughs> so um, the, pro the compilation problem is one that I think is a, 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 an extremely great concern because people could try these products, they could say, oh, this is no good, uh, drop them and never try them again. And I think that's, a, uh, that's going to be, that's a, that could be uh, something that kills the entire effort. A second problem with high performance Fortran is that because there's a long distance between the program you write and the one that actually runs, so all this message passing happens and code gets moved around and loops get interchanged and communication moves out of loops and all sorts of things, there is a mystifying, I'll call it mystifying, relationship between the program and the performance that program achieves. It is possible to make a small set of changes which for some reason or another causes certain kinds of communications to be disabled. Uh, it's very easy to do that if you make, if you take, uh, on some compilers, if you just take a, a constant and change it into a parameter of some kind, a, a variable of some kind, that you, but still nevertheless assigned to be a constant as the program. A lot of compilers will, will break and, and do stupid things. Uh, I have some examples of that. Um, so the question is, how do you overcome that? Well, you'd like to overcome it, as, as I'll show you, a bit, with, with additional tools that help people understand that relationship without forcing them to, uh, to understand all of the compilers
compiler steps that happen between the high-level language and, the, and what they run on the target machine. In other words, they ha shouldn't have to read line by line the message passing program that comes out, or even worse, uh, lower-level versions of the same program. They should be able to understand performance as much as possible in terms of the program they wrote with a little bit of additional information. And finally, High Performance Fortran, as currently defined, only covers one part of the spectrum. Uh, it covers regular, uh, essentially the, the, the regular data parallel programs. Those, those things which are really look like finite difference techniques or dense linear algebra, mm -hmm. things like that. There is no support currently for probably regular problems. And I'll show you what kind of support might be added by talking a little bit about Fortran D in a moment. There is no support for what might be called task parallelism or object parallelism. It's all oriented towards dividing up the data. There's no functional parallelism of any kind. And finally, um, high performance input and output is not explicitly supported. Uh, in fact, uh, we wrote in the, uh, the standard that we explicitly considered high performance uh, input output, but we didn't do anything. And the reason we didn't do anything was A, in one year, we didn't have enough time to figure out whether there was anything good we could do. There was no research body that we could rely on, whereas with the compiler part, we understood there was a lot of research that we could build on. So I'd like to focus on these issues for just a moment and tell you a little bit about, um, about uh, all three of them. First, I'd like to talk about our compiler experience at, at our center. We've done uh, some proto, we built two prototype compilers uh, Chao Wen Sen, who visited here uh, over the last year or so, uh, talked a little bit about the, his, his version of the compiler. I'll talk about that and summarize what he did, but I want to talk about both. Uh, Jeffrey Fox's group at Syracuse built a compiler system that was aimed at Fortran 90D. And the focus of this work was uh, essentially to investigate what you could do by, uh, by forgetting about the problem of implicit parallelism. He wanted, he, he did not have a big, uh, big compiler machinery like we built up at Rice over the years. So he wanted to work on the problem of trying to take advantage of the part of the, of the part of the problem that he understood best, which was how to build a library of very, very high performance computation and communication kernels. He, he had spent a lot of time working on hypercubes, understood the importance of specialized communication kernels for global computations and even uh, wanted to be able to take advantage of computation kernels, recognize that being able to take advantage of things like makers multiply coded on a particular machine. So the basic uh, model here for the compilation was that array operations would be strip mined and then scalarized. <laughs> that means is they would be taken from vector form to scalar form. Turns out this is, non, this is a non-trivial operation uh, because uh, there's certain kinds of overlaps which can make it force you to do long-term, long copies. But in any case, there's a lot, there's more to it than, than just those two uh, things. But the main part of the compiler was recognized when the resulting loop and the communication generated thereby could be handled by a specialized communication or computation routine. And he built a prototype compiler. It works rather well. Um, and the, um, um, the, the compiler that is built by the Portland group for Mako and Intel is is based upon this general scheme, although you're going to add in a lot more features. Now, the work at Rice, since we had had a long, uh, a long time, a long standing research project in automatic parallelization and deep program analysis, we decided to take Fortran 7070 and focus on finding implicit parallelism. In other words, we looked at the current users and say, how are they going to come up? And one of the, one of the things we wanted to do was try to understand uh, how we could use these distributions to find implicit parallels. And of course, we would automatically generate again communication just as the Syracuse compiler would it, and try to do a lot with communication optimization um, of the, uh, where we would take communications generated by separate statements and try and merge them into a larger communication. We, did, we spent a lot more time on the sort of internal optimizing phases of the language, whereas Jeffrey relied on the, on the underlying online library. And as I say here, there's a confluence of uh, compiler technologies, including starting with data flow analysis, which was a sort of John Cox, Fran Allen uh, uh, origins of that in, in, the, in the 
early days when John and Fran were working on computers right after the Fortran 1 through dependence analysis, which is the standard technology of vectorizing compilers, program transformation technology that was developed for vectorizing and parallelizing compilers, and now whole program analysis and optimization. Because as I said, I think it's very difficult to compile these languages really at the top efficiency without doing some of that. So I'm going to skip all the stuff on compiler uh, implementations and just give you this summary slide. So here is what we do in the Fortran 7070 compiler. First, we propagate distributions interprocedurally, as I said before, simply because we need to know. Uh, oh, I should mention, by the way, that in the Chatwin Sen uh, prototype, this, the things that are started here were not implemented. So the results we got were based upon the compiler that did not include these features. Uh, script mine by data distribution anywhere. So once we do the data distributions, we could, we could then generate parallelism by doing the script mining. We're generating an SPMD program that's executed by each processor uh, in the machine and only uh, basically the, the code is disambiguated by the use of uh, sort of local position pointers or pointers that tell you which processor you are and so forth. Then, the, uh, yes? The, the procedural analysis, can the subroutine specify alternative decomposition and you try and read them some of uh, Yes. Uh, the way it works in, uh, the way it works in, uh, in Fortran D, and this is a little bit more complicated than APF, so I won't tell you the whole thing. But in Fortran D, the model was that if the subroutine specified a distribution, then the, uh, the, the, the data array would be redistributed to that distribution on entry, and then redistributed back to the original distribution on entry. Okay? Uh, that was not, uh, so they could specify the distribution on entry. So in HPF, there's a whole collection of options, uh, which I'd rather not go into. But we could do it later. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you where you can get the APF document. You can read the web, uh, all the options. But you can you can uh, you can inherit one. You can force a change, uh, and so forth. Okay, so um, then we wanted to vectorize and coalesce messages. As I said, we were planning to overlap communication and computation. We didn't get that done in time, but we discovered that it was extremely important. Uh, we did a coarse grain pipelining. My batteries are going out in real time. Uh, coarse grain pipelining. We managed storage through strip mining, uh, recognized uh, collective communication. Uh, that was planned. We, we, entered, we, we observed what was done in, in, um, in Jeffrey Fox's group. By the way, I should mention managing storage. One of the interesting things about managing storage is that you can one of the things that's very easy to do is assume you have uh, infinite buffer space. So a lot of times you have to do additional program transformations to manage your buffer space so that you don't have to send <coughs> bounded amounts of data to any processor to, uh, to do the computation you're doing. And this usually adds a couple of extra loops to the computation. Recognizing collective communication is very important. We didn't do that in the first compiler. And then generating communication interprocedurally, by which I mean going down into the routines and putting sends and receives where they had to be even due to loops that were in the calling procedure for that routine. OK, so I won't tell you uh, about the performance of the system, except to summarize what our, our, uh, our, uh, our analysis and our experiments did. Essentially, to summarize the analysis on our prototype, we ended up being within about 95% of what are called stencil, uh, of hand code, for what are called stencil computations, which uh, we, we, we viewed as total success. Stencil computations, anything like finite difference, uh, two and three dimensional simulations, the regular. Um, and uh, in fact, on some cases, in some cases in our experiments, we actually turned out to do better than the hand code uh, for reasons having to do with the, the com underlying compiler. You know, the hand code compiled in Fortran plus message passing, and they would assume some compiler optimizations that we never assumed, but that are too tedious to be done by hand. And so, uh, and so those cases where, uh, where that <coughs> happened, we would actually beat the, uh, the hand coder. Uh, and, and on the sort of triangular style calculations like linear algebra and on pipeline computations where the pipeline, there's no way to get out of the pipeline by redistributing, we were, we were within 50% of the calculation, uh, or at least the 
never outside of factor of two on the, on the set of programs we ran. So this is, this actually that was roughly our goal. If we, we thought we could be within a factor of two, that would be pretty close. And we'd be delighted with anything better. So we were very happy about that, but we weren't happy about the things we were missing. We were missing a lot of things because this level of optimization we were performing was beyond even the, the, the capabilities of the system that we built for vectorization and parallelization. We needed interprocedural symbolic analysis that was far more powerful to do a really good job. Uh, we needed better ways of, we needed to be able to insert code at runtime to disambiguate certain kinds of situations which at compile time couldn't be disambiguated. And, and so the code that you generate now would be very, very slow. Whereas if you've tested things at runtime, you might be able to do, uh, to do things a lot better. And we need, a, a, we need to put in all the optimizations we said we we're going to put in. And the key one that we left out was overlapping communication and computation. I'd say number two in our compiler was recognition of communication and computation kernels. Those two key optimizations are, are really, really important to do a good job. We didn't do it in that compiler. We could have gotten better than the results we did. And finally, we need some improved interprocedural compilation. Some problems occurred because let me say one, in inter, the most common case that you, uh, the reason you have, most people, the way most people write a Fortran program, they do not, and in write Fortran D, is they do not end up using multiple distributions for the same data array. What they typically will do is uh, they might call the same routine with two different data arrays distributed in two different ways. So from here, they'll call a routine with one call chain and another with a different call chain. And because of those two different data rates, they get two different decompositions at the, at the, at the call routine. One way to, to eliminate that, one is always better than two. You can also generate much more, much better code if you know exactly what the distribution is. And so one thing we speculated was that there weren't going to be so many call chains that cloning, by making two copies of the procedure on a call chain dependent basis, we could disambiguate all those cases. And it turns out in practice uh, that, that the programs we've looked at uh, this works completely well. It, 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 it doesn't happen. We don't get too much cloning, and um, and we do get complete disambiguation. So we think this is going to be very successful. It's not. It's not implemented. It wasn't implemented in our in our test studies. And finally, uh, we're not yet moving communications across procedure boundaries. We, we're generating communications inside procedures where they're needed, but we're not aggregating communications outside of procedure. So we're not interchanging sends, receives, and procedure calls. That is also very important. Okay. Uh, so that's problem set number one. Uh, that was the compiler. The, the bottom line on the compiler work is that good compilers are possible, but a lot of work is required. And that means that uh, I, I would advise anybody who's planning to try one of these languages not to expect the highest level of performance from the first products that come out of your vendor's box. Uh, but if you have some patience, I believe these compilers will come around just as the, the, uh, the CM Fortran compiler made enormous strides forward. So now I'd like to talk about missing features. And the features I want to talk, uh, talk about are uh, first the support for irregular problems. As I said, Fortran D and HPF <coughs> originally defined good for regular computations. The distinction, irregular computations are those that involve irregular meshes or sparse uh, or sparse or, or linear algebra, sparse, or, uh, sparse data arrays. Uh, from the compiler writer's perspective, uh, the way to tell that you're deep, the compiler thinks it's a, an irregular computation if it sees uh, a subscripted variable inside another subscript. Okay, for, that, from, for, for all intents and purposes, that forces all of the analysis you have to do to do your regular computations. Now, what's the best way to do uh, general irregular computations on existing parallel computers? Well, the work that I'm most familiar with and I think is generally regarded to be the best is that done by Joel Saltz, at, uh, who's now at the University of Maryland. The basic idea of Joel Saltz is to use something called an inspector-executor method. This method is based upon the bet that uh, data distribution for these irregular problems is done less often than data communication, far less often. 
So essentially what happens in this computation, if you want to write, if you want to write the computation by hand, is the programmer has to generate some kind of, has to produce a load balancing function that balances, that assigns elements in the collection of elements that you're representing in your program to processors. So you, you build a function or an array which maps elements in your, in your computation elements to processors. That's a load balancing step. Then, in, during the computation, every time a communication is required, you have to analyze by, at runtime to understand where that communication is going and generate the communication sort of on the fly. Uh, Saltz's technique is a little bit better than that in that what it does is it has an inspector which goes through the program at runtime and analyzes, once the load balancing function is known, will analyze the communication that's going to be required in each iteration of the time step loop and then generate, a, a reorganize, generate a, a, an execution and communication schedule, which is the best you can do uh, for that particular communication pattern. And then on each iteration of the time step, it will execute that communication pattern. And to support that, he has a library of communication routines that use hash tables and all sorts of things like that. But he's able to get reasonably good performance on these irregular problems, so long as the mesh but the, the mapping does not change very often, so that you get to reuse the same schedule on many time steps. Now in Fortran D, uh, we're working with Joel and Jeffrey to build uh, versions of the Fortran D compilers that actually automate the part of that process which is, uh, which is done in generating the communication and the inspection of the communication that's required. In other words, the programmer is still required, I think I've lost this thing, no, the programmer is still required to produce an array called map that, um, or whatever you want to call it. You can use a distribute statement, which instead of using block or cyclic, you, you have an array which, which the programmer computes. It could also be a function. And then uh, the compiler will generate the code automatically. It will generate the code. But once that array is determined, will determine the communication and computation schedule and, uh, and then carry out that communication computation with no further changes in the, in the user's program. So that is the, the, and in fact, it turns out that some load balancers for particular kinds of problems, like those which represent, say, n-body problems, where most of the computation, uh, n-body problems have the thing that they're, they're looking at doing force calculations in pairs. And typically, in, in many n-body calculations, you can actually approximate the calculation by having Cut off. So most of the force calculations that you'll be interested in are with, with um, elements that are very close to you in physical space. So the, the automatic decomposition scheme you want to use is one that chops up things that puts processors, that puts elements in physical space that are close together on the same processor. And we have a, a mechanism for, for generating those kinds of decompositions automatically. So this is the kind of support which we have a prototype compiler working. We haven't got the experiments going yet, uh, done yet. So that's in the works. And, uh, and we can provide at least the level of support which avoids the programmer having to write all that code to, to examine and generate schedules and carry those schedules out. I wanted to say something about, par I don't want to say anything about task parallelism. Uh, I think there are lots and lots of uh, places, uh, suggestions for task parallelism. I think there's not yet a consensus on the right way to express it in the context of Fortran or C. Uh, and there are plenty of, of options out there. Uh, high Performance Fortran Forum is, in fact, considering, uh, if we're going to into a second round of consideration where we, we started, we got, we got lonely. We started, we missed each other after a year off, and we decided to start meeting again to handle small, uh, small changes and corrections, and also to, to start planning for a real uh, standardization phase we'll look at. I.O., task parallelism, and irregular problems. So HBF is looking at this, uh, and there are plenty of uh, options for task parallelism. For example, one is the uh, parallel uh, uh, PCF, parallel computing forum, generated a set of uh, task parallelism primitives, which eventually were adopted by a group called X3H5. That's one set of possibilities, and there are many others. I want to talk a little bit about parallel I.O. Uh, because uh, we started a project in this simply because uh, people, would, I would give a talk like this and people say, well, it's all very interesting, but what about parallel I.O.? And I didn't have a good response to that. So I started asking back, what, uh, what is the parallel I.O. problem in your opinion? And I got lots and lots of answers. 
and the answers I got are, the, are essentially can almost all be categorized into these three categories. IE parallel IO support out of four arrays. I don't have enough memory even on the parallel system to to do all of my uh, to, to hold my program. Uh, virtual memory doesn't work on this parallel system. Uh, or at least it, it doesn't work in, in real time. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we all know which parallel system I'm talking about. <laughs> at least most of us do. Um, and uh, and I I need but I need to run this program, so I have to physically move data in and out. In fact, it turns out there are not many out-of-core programs. Actually, I'll come back to that in a moment. Then there's the issue of checkpointing. I should say checkpointing and restarting, but uh, it turns out that uh, you know checkpointing happens a lot more frequently than restarting, so most of, most of the performance problems are incurred by checkpointing. Not many people complain about the time to restart because the alternative is too horrible. <laughs> So, um, so checkpointing and massive amounts of data that have to be written out from time to time to be able to restart. And finally, a lot of people are interested in real-time output for monitoring visualization, watching the proce uh, process in real time. So we wanted to look at one of these. The one that, that was most interesting to us was looking at out of four arrays. And the real problem here is it's very hard to write these programs. It's almost as hard as it is to write message passing programs. And that's why they're so few. Everybody says, I need out of core. And I said, well, you don't have an out of core. You haven't written an out of core program. He says, well, no. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm not solving the problem I want to solve. I just don't have time to write this program. I can't solve the big problem, even though computationally it's not that intractable. We observed that in Fortran D, we're already dealing with uh, specifications for data distribution across a set of processors and we're generating all the communication. Is it that far a step to generate all of the I.O. that's needed if you use the same kind of distribution specification to say we're distributing across uh, an array of, uh, 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 distributing across a, pro uh, a disk array instead of a processor array? Perhaps the easiest way to think about it is if you have a processor on a disk on every processor. But you can still use the same basic idea to, uh, to optimize uh, input and output when you're distributing across a set of disks that have their own I.O. processors. So we just uh, are investigating the impact of uh, out-of-core array specification by just adding to the Fortran D distribution specification that an array, is, uh, a whole collection of arrays are to be out-of-core. And, um, and essentially a lot of the analysis goes over. We haven't got that part implemented yet. We've done some hand studies and on a single processor, um, we've been able to do uh, generate out of core solutions automatically, which um, which are 50 to 100 percent better in timing than virtual memory on the same unit processor. That's those are just preliminary results, but they show that there is possible to generate uh, to, to generate by compiler a lot of uh, uh, to improve the performance of a system that helps deal with out of core by using compiler techniques. What, what's left open, it seems to me, is how, what's the best right way to implement this collection? Obviously, we want to interact with the I.O. system. What, how much should be, uh, of the I.O. system should be used? This out-of-core approach is very good for things you can analyze statically, not so good for things you can't analyze statically. Can we help with things that are more dynamic and need to be done at runtime? Okay, so that's parallel I.O. And finally, I wanted to say something about this mystifying relationship between uh, between the program and its uh, and its eventual uh, object version. So what I'd like to say a little bit about is, in order to investigate this, I believe we believe that the days when a compiler could be developed in uh, in a vacuum are long gone. That a compiler has to be developed with an entire suite of tools in mind. The first crack was, of course, the symbolic debugger, where the compiler has to pass all its tables over in order to be able to debug code. Then with vectorization came the interactive vectorizer. This was a way to avoid, to show people how well the compiler was doing without having them to understand all of the code that was being generated by that compiler in terms of vector code. So essentially what would happen is you'd get a listing back that said V by a, um, by a statement that was vectorized and say uh, S by a statement, you know, S was bad, V was good. 
Um, and, it, and there would be some partials, I guess they use P or something like that, where you're able to do some kind of thing, but it wasn't straight, it wasn't complete victory. So V was victory. And these things became very popular, that they actually ran without even generating code. They were very fast, and people could understand very quickly, and they had little messages which explained what was it that inhibited the vectorization and how the, might even suggest how the program could be improved. Well, it's not going to be that simple for parallel computing, just not. Uh, we're going to need a whole suite of tools, and uh, essentially, we've been working on a, a, a something called the D system or D environment, which is intended to be an example of the kinds of things you'll need to support HPF or Fortran D languages like that. Uh, our system is based upon essentially four building blocks. One is the interprocedural analysis and optimization infrastructure we built so was part of an earlier system called Periscope and, and an original system which we call the RN programming environment. There, as an editor, a, 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 an intelligent editor, which is essentially a, a, a full-fledged uh, text and structure editor. It, it has uh, incremental compilation and you can do structure editing, but in addition it has all the deep analysis of the compiler. It can do dependence analysis and show that, and it supports automated transformations of the sort we found useful in parallel, parallelism. And a debugging system and a performance analysis and visualization system. And perhaps the most interesting thing about this system is that all of the system is viewed essentially through one, uh, through one eye, that is the, through the editor. The editor shows us a, a universal <coughs> view of the program, and you get to see, uh, you get information from the compiler, information from the whole program analysis system. The, you can, you'll run the debugger uh, through the editor view. Uh, performance information will be shown in the editor. And in fact, you can even, one of the things we, we can do, Fortran D, one of the sort of side effects of Fortran D is it provides a wonderful platform to do research on automatic generation of, uh, of distributions. Because now, if all you have to do is generate the Fortran D distribution information automatically, and then you can expect the compiler uh, to do the rest, and you can compare with the best hand-coded versions that way if you wish. Uh, the nice thing about this being a, a tool instead of a part of the compiler is that you can now actually experiment with, this is a tool rather than a piece of the Higher, you can experiment with things like integer programming. You don't mind if it runs for a couple of hours, if it saves you a lot of work. Uh, but all of these things operate through the window of the de-editor. And just to show you how, I, I had a, an image. I was hoping, I didn't get time to do it today. I had an image that was so big I couldn't print it on my color printer. And I was hoping to find one here that I could print it on. But I'm sure you had one, but I just never got around to asking you about it. But let me show you, the, give you the flavor of the kinds of things you see in the editor. This is just what the editor does to, to display certain issues about performance. If you have a distribution that looks like this, A and B are distributed block, you know, using block distribution, and you see this do loop. This loop might be painted blue, which indicates that the loop is parallel. It crosses processors. In other words, A and B are both distributed across processors in the I dimension, so it actually crosses processors, and it's fully parallel. There's no dependence which inhibits running that but there is a communication that's required when you, uh, in the last element on the right that you need, uh, you actually have to fetch that from uh, the first element on, in, in, of the uh, decomposition on the next processor over. So this might be just shown in red, and in fact we have uh, drawing ways of showing the, the actual cross-processor dependencies which give rise to communication in a computation like this, as well as painting the, the references that give rise to so I think you can see that there are ways of viewing the program using colors and indentation and the annotation that can show you a lot about what the performance is going to be like without actually showing you the ugly send and receive primitives. Okay, well, I'd like to stop here and just summarize by essentially telling you what I hope I've gotten across today. First, scalable computing is a crossroads. It hasn't really come over to practical application as rapidly as we hoped it would. And I think this has been a great disappointment for most of us in the community. But it's really our fault. We, we, under, we underestimated the amount of effort that would be required in software uh, to, to be able to use these systems effectively, at least to make them just as usable. This is a standard which we didn't think was so high a couple few years ago. But we'd like to make them just as usable as a, as a conventional vector supercomputer. 
that used to not be a high standard for us to achieve. <laughs> but now, but now, you know, never mind a workstation or a personal computer. But, um, but, uh, but we just like to get to that standard. And even getting just there requires a lot of work. And in particular, I mean, there's a lot of system work, there's a lot of uh, language work, but in the compiler technology, we'd like to support a high-level specification of parallelism, a machine-independent interface. Interface, And I say the automatic parallelization, even though a lot of research has been done, has not proved to be enough by itself. Uh, there's still some people who, who think they may be able to get it with that, but I've not been convinced so, so far, and I've done a lot of research on that topic. Fortran D and high performance Fortran, at least the current versions, are aimed at focusing, a focus on only a small part of the overall problem, which is that part related to data parallelism where you divide up the data domain. We think it's a promising step, but until, of course, uh, we have full acceptance of the language, we won't really know. And, uh, and I, uh, in order for this, uh, this effort to be a success, we're going to need a very sophisticated compiler technology, which won't come overnight. And in addition, we're going to need a substantial amount of patience from the users. Thank you very much.